Welcome. We are here talking with uh, Charles Plot uh, at the second experimental economics workshop and conference in Antigua, Guatemala, in beautiful Casa Popeno. Uh, welcome, Charlie. Well, thank you. I'm enjoying it very much. It is beautiful. Great. Charlie is one of the pioneers in uh, experimental economics, uh, made large contributions throughout history to experimental methods and experimental economics in general. Um, can you tell us how you got started in experimental economics from the University of Virginia? The start was probably in pure theory. Uh, we discovered ways that uh, we could use public goods and externalities to, uh, to create new forms of organization to solve collective problems. And these were all theory, completely all theory. Uh, no experiments had been done on anything similar at the time. That uh, theory continued and was generalized by many mathematicians. And I thought that the, um, the mathematics was not really very accurate. I didn't think it would work. I thought it was a logical, fun game, but I thought from a practical point of view, it could not possibly work. And then um, I became uh, acquainted with um, the early experimental work that had gone in, gone, that had taken place in economics, namely Vernon Smith's uh, experiments. I was at Purdue at the time. And uh, through conversations with him and thinking about it, I realized that you could take these methods that Vernon had developed years ago, uh, this is the late, early 70s I was working then, and this is material or work that he had done in the early, early to mid 60s. I realized how you could adjust and modify his, uh, his techniques to do experiments on these very abstract political problems that I had worked on. I'd done the mathematics on much of it. So I uh, joined with a political science named Mo Furina, and we actually did experiments on these, these areas that I thought would not work. In fact, the whole objective was to show that my theory would not work because it would mean all these mathematicians who were friends of mine uh, were wasting their time. I thought that would be fun to, uh, to, to disrupt the, that research. And who better qualified to do it was the guy than would be the guy who invented the theory. That was me. So we ran the little experiments. And I remember when Mo Furina went off to, he just left after I told him what to do and ran it. And he came back maybe with two hours later and he said, Charlie, you will not believe what happened. What? He says it went directly to the equilibrium. I didn't believe him. So immediately I had to try it myself. The same thing happened. Then we tried it over and over and over again. It continued to happen. So we were faced with a problem where we were actually discovering a theory worked that was not supposed to work, which ordinarily would be a great thing to report. The problem was it was my theory. So if I reported an experiment which says this theory worked, and it was my theory, almost surely no one would believe. Especially at that time where experiments and, uh, well, were and there were no experiments done anywhere, anywhere. So, so we embarked on a, uh, a, a process of looking at alternative theories and testing this theory against other theories and changing the institutions to see if this theory was really robust in ways that the theory said it should be. And that allowed us to explore and report what we now knew uh, using experimental methods. And now that was, that was where it started with me. But then soon after that, Vernon came to Caltech and uh, we became interested in markets. And so I could use the same trick that I'd learned from political science to apply to markets. Vernon and I taught a course together and we generalized using the political methodologies to multiple units, looking at the institution, in this case, the posted price, 
Uh, we invented the idea of uh, efficiency to measure these, these things. Uh, discovered the posted price effect, which then led into applications, and that, that discovery and our collaboration basically led to what you see now. So that was, that was the way I got started, was um, just out of curiosity, basically out of curiosity. It was all curiosity for me. And a lot of your early work, as you said, it was in political science or public choice or political economy. Right. And how was that influenced by, you, you mentioned you were, or you, you were a student of uh, Coase and uh, James Buchanan. Yes. How, how did I, that influence your early interest or curiosity? Well, I think that uh, Coase influenced me because he's a very careful scientist. So I learned much from Ronald Coase about how to be careful and what was in a literature. Uh, Buchanan was interested in institutional design, the whole public choice movement was about institutional design, new institutions, new ways of doing things, none of which had been tested experimentally, or we didn't even know how to test them experimentally. So that literature led to uh, a way of designing and asking questions that an experimentalist could act, could act on. We had in the background not only the public choice, we had axiomatic social choice theory, the error theorem, and these huge questions about uh, public motivation, public intentions, and those also led to, uh, to questions about experiments and processes and mechanisms and experiments. Probably the first big departure from the early ones was the agenda theory. We discovered that how to design a pr process or an agenda to manipulate groups to do what you wanted them to do. That was not only theoretical and experimental, it was actually practical. We actually learned from the field. So that took us from the laboratory to the field almost immediately in such a subtle way we didn't even realize that there was a question about it. It just worked. And uh, that led to consulting problems uh, that uh, were quite important. Um, there was a major um, problem dealing with um, interstate commerce about whether uh, prices should be posted with the Interstate Commerce Commission. Well, of course, that's directly related to the early experiments that Vernon and I had done. So that took me into questions about how one can pose an experiment that would uh, get the attention of a policymaker, which takes it out of the question of just testing theories, the mathematics, or classical experimental design. It's a different type of audience that needed to be addressed. Working with that problem uh, shaped, heavily shaped, uh, all of my subsequent research um, dealing with how to design experiments, what you do with an experiment. That's very interesting because, as you mentioned, you started as a theorist interested in, I don't know if you would say, testing theories, tinkering with theories, or exploring theories in, in, in a controlled environment. But late, later on, you have moved to, or you have seen that those theories, the testing of those theories has applications to the real world. Well, to me, there's really not, no difference between the real, to me, the laboratory is the real world. It's simple. You have to realize it's really simple, and the, many times I've said in writing and otherwise that if they have general theories, they apply in simple cases. And so it's very natural for me to ask, uh, does the theory apply in simple cases? But the theory is what you need, what's needed when you go to complex. You cannot run a, learn about the complex world in a laboratory. That's the reason you have laboratories, is because you can't do the natural experiments that you need to do. So you can only rely on theory. There's only one place you can learn about complex theories and their robustness, and that's in laboratory. So that's, and for me, it's such a natural place to start. But what's different, and I think is different, we were always not asking does, a, does an institution have an effect, or does a personality have an effect, or does a procedure have an effect? We were never really interested in effects. We were always interested in how accurate is the theory 
knowing that various and sundry effects could affect the accuracy of the theory. But we really wanted to know, are the principles that are guiding us have some level of reliability? So the experimenter, experiments allowed us to do two things. Ask about, its, ask about its reliability, even at a very low level, and then ask about its robustness when you start changing the variables that you think might be important when you go to the field. So again, it's such a natural relationship. I, I, could, I could never ever imagine how to go about it any other, any other way. It's kind of interesting, I was thinking back on this. I think that when I first started this, uh, I thought that, um, that experiments should take over, and this is my very first experiment. Experiments were so powerful they must take over almost applied policy level research sooner or later. I thought that was absolutely inevitable because of the power that we saw in these simple cases. But to go back to your question, realize it's a joining between experiment and the theory that makes it powerful. You cannot do without the theory. Even though it's not very accurate, even though it might be wrong, it's still powerful. So you have to worry about that. Yeah. All theories or all models are false in some sense, but they're usually useful or helpful because... It's a question of helpfulness, not truth. Yes. The, then, like you say, you know, the, you, know the, you know the theory's false. That's not an issue. The, uh, the question is, how accurate is it? How misleading is it? How robust is it? Uh, how might it mislead you when you start designing institutions? Does it give you intuition about the way processes might work? That's where it's, uh, it's powerful. And, and in that sense, you have followed with a lot of uh, experiments that you have used in the lab and applied what you've learned there to complex market or complex uh, institutional design in several settings. Can you talk about some of those? For instance, uh, I believe you've done some work in, for ecosystem services, designing markets for ecosystem services in Australia? Or Well, yeah, actually. So from the very first, I've been doing that. I always thought that to, to, for a, a technique or a method to be valuable, it had to be sufficiently powerful that someone somewhere could make a living doing it, right? And the only way you could make, like an engineer, it has to be useful in a very practical way. And so at the very first, I was exploring these practical matters, uh, the, the um, agenda theory was born out of a practical matter. A friend of mine wanted a big, huge club to buy a particular fleet of planes, and we designed the agenda to get them to do what he wanted. That was followed by the, the barge study, the posted price study, which was addressing a, uh, a policy issue posed in the U.S. Department of Transportation. This is the early 70s. That was followed by a study of the rights to allocate landing in the, in the major airports, and uh, which used a committee process. We studied the committee process for the Civil Aeronautics Board, explained to the committee members and the Civil Aeronautics Board why that process was causing and would cause further problems, and showed them that there were alternatives, namely dealing with auctions and related ways to allocate the right to land. That, by the way, then was the first kind of type of combinatorial auctions that we see now that are even used in the spectrum auctions. We did uh, some antitrust. Uh, we worried about should professions like uh, lawyers and doctors be allowed to, uh, to advertise their services. And again, those were all laboratory studies, but they were huge questions uh, faced by policymakers. And we could give them some intuition about what it is they might experience if they did this. And since they, they must, that must be followed by maybe 20, 30, 40 different applied projects, each one which is typically tested and explored in the lab before you apply it in the field. And that's very important because when you go to the field, the person who's responsible for, for inside a government organization 
an, uh, an exp experiment like that is not an experiment for that person. That's a job. If it fails, if he's promoted it, and if it fails, he's going to be out of a job. So your experiment cannot be an experiment when it goes to the policy level. It must work because your friend's job is on the line. So it's very serious to make this step from, uh, from the laboratory to the field to, to make sure it works. And lucky we've been really, really, really very fortunate. And I think that's not a reflection of our skills. It's a reflection of the fact that economic principles and even the principles of political science and puts it, are quite robust. They really are there. They're reliable. Uh, you just have to understand them and know how to see them and know how to use them. But they're there. Uh, uh, now, a lot of your work on, on, on this, uh, on the edge of applied uh, economic problems or institutional design, especially related to combinatorial or mar uh, auctions or markets, can be interpreted as designing a market where it's missing, right? Because the problem is so complex that, that there's not a, a single uh, market solution. So what do you think about that interpretation of designing an institutional setting for the market uh, there to function more efficiently? Well, I think that I would push that back. When you study a policy problem, the question you need to ask is, well, why isn't a market operating there already? Because in the policy area, you can see there's inefficiencies. The history of uh, processes, unless there's a political problem, is that the market designs and, uh, seem to evolve institutionally to remove efficiencies. Well, why is it, you have to ask yourself, has a market not already been in place? As you look, you'll, you typically will find that there's something about the policy situation that a classical market can't handle. What might that be? A failure of property rights, an externality, a non-convexity. It, uh, it could be an underlying instability because of uh, because you can have instabilities in markets. So as you look at the a coordination problem, so as you look at the policy problems, typically what you'll find is that there is, there is something missing. That's the reason there's not a market. What the theory has to do, or must do, is exp help you see what that is. And then it must help you understand what type of institution, practical institution, we'll correct it. And so we've seen this over and over and over again, that that role of theory as a guide to an identification of the problem, as well as a fix of the problem, uh, is there. And, and as I said, to do that, really, you need theory. You just can't look and say it's not working. You have to understand why, and there's only one way you're going to know that. That's through the theory. Now, sometimes businessmen know, by the way. While they can't articulate the theory, that does not mean they don't understand the theory. They know. So people that are close to these problems can frequently tell you the nature of the problem. Uh, they can't articulate it or generalize it or abstract it in a way that allows the tools to be applied. But... Uh, Usually when you find one of these things, uh, you won't be alone when you identify the problem. The policymakers themselves are going to know. So how do you think experimental economics has evolved during the last, uh, say, 30 years? And where, where do you think it's headed? In the 30 years? Well, one of the things we see is um, we see several things. We see um, a move from uh, into electronic into labs, uh, into control through computers. That in, in turn has allowed us to design very special types of institutions that could never ever exist without uh, computer and internet based relationships. Uh, it also allows us to control, to create experiments and test things that we could never do uh, the, in the, as in the early days. We also see several revolutions like we see uh, a type of game theory revolution. I was thinking even here in this conference, uh, 
uh, in thinking about what my introduction slide should look like. Uh, well, I think I'll start out with uh, demand and supply. And you might ask, why would you start out with demand and supply in a conference that's filled with experimental economists? The reason is because those experimental economists don't do demand and supply anymore. They do game theory. So that type of basic law and what we know has kind of evolved in a different set of principles. Now, the, the great issue is, well, how can we make those principles compatible? How can we build on them both? But we've been in that process now. Game theory allows us to go back to asymmetric information, uh, very unusual institutions, contracts, that we could never do just with the law of supply and demand. So there's a problem of, of merging those two as we watch game theory become so much more important. We begin to see the nature of the tools, the nature of the principles, and the nature of the institutions that we could use evolve. More recently, we're seeing more of a movement towards the individual and uh, individual subjective probabilities, perceptions, going back to how the individual processes stuff. Well, there's a big area, about, a big issue about how one goes from an individual to a market. Currently, we can't do that. No one can do that. So what happens at the individual level, we all know is important, but how to merge that with these more macro type principles is still quite, uh, quite, quite an issue. But again, those are the areas we see information, game theory, individual preferences, individual behavior. Uh, those are just dramatic changes that we've seen in the last, even in the last decade. Well, this has been a very stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for, for inviting me. I love Antigua. This is a, it's a great place. It's a great conference, and uh, I'm learning a lot. Thanks for inviting me.